of, uh, of evaluating this, the similarity between these different bins uh, and brought up the Kolmogorov Smirnov test a couple times, which is effectively looking is this non-parametric test looking at the uh, equality of distributions. Um, and I think it's actually pretty helpful to visualize in, in this way. So what we're looking at here is as compiled in Biggin at all 2015, uh, and filtered on QPI, looking at a cumulative distribution uh, of these of these uh, paleo intensity estimates. So here, where we're seeing uh, how many are in uh, each, uh, the sort of cumulative distribution of that going going up in here. And here we can see this is effectively another way to visualize this result that in this mid bin, uh, these estimates are appreciably lower than in the mid the mid end and late. Um, so I was thinking I was going to go after, uh, uh, be presenting after Alexi um, uh, presented. Um, hopefully some of you saw, uh, uh, have, have seen him present some of this, this uh, recently, um, but I figured, and I sort of ran some of these main points by, um, by, by John, uh, some of the critiques that were also uh, to this interpretation of the database, um, which Andy also alluded to in his, uh, his talk this morning. I think the, the main point that was highlighted in uh, here, this is a quote from the abstract of the paper, um, was the argument that there are several database, uh, several data sets uh, in this late bin um, that are argued to overestimate the true strength and that when these overestimates are removed, that the database does not indicate a robust change in geomagnetic field intensity during the Mesoproterozoic. <clears throat> so that, uh, and I'll show some examples of the data from which that, that argument is, is being made. Uh, the, main, the main points that was, the main point uh, that was primarily highlighted associated with that quote is that some mesoproterozoic data are overestimates. Um, this would be particularly data at 1.3 and 1.1 uh, billion years ago. There are two other arguments here. One, that considering locality level means rather than site means is the way data analysis should be done. Um, this can significantly affect interpretations. I think uh, uh, and Andy, Andy showed uh, the way of how independent some of these interpretations are for uh, dealing with type type two errors, um, and there's also this came up in uh, in Kathy, one of Kathy's questions, and it's sort of shown in another way here that there are significant changes in geomagnetic field intensity uh, uh, in more recent time bins. So here's an example of that: if we've been the past five million years versus taking another five million year bin, um, so that would be looking at significantly shorter time bins uh, that are being dealt with here in the in the bins of the Precambrian data, um, but it's nevertheless a feature of the record. So here we've we've seen some array plots. There's there's some people in the room where this is a very familiar thing to look at. Some people where that's where that's not the case. Um, but I'm going to show I'm going to be showing a few of these and trying to eluc uh, elucidate for you what uh, what they mean. Uh, so here we're seeing uh, on this the natural remnant magnetization of a rock, which is being progressively removed as an artificial thermal remnant is being applied in in the lab. Uh, in an ideal situation, you get a single slope uh, where the known uh, field that's being applied in the lab combined with the slope uh, can give you an estimate of, of the, the field strength. Here is an example from, uh, these are just before the mid-continent drift, uh, some dikes, we have a TB dikes where we see pretty uh, clean experimental results uh, getting uh, a single slope and this resulting uh, estimate uh, for the virtual actual dipole moment. Now, this is an example of, of non-ideal behavior um, where you're not getting just a single slope coming down, uh, but instead have a slope that's coming down and then a different slope as an experiment progresses. Now, when this study was done, this is data from the mid-continent rift, uh, it was argued that here you are starting to experience alteration such that your experiment was progressing beautifully and then it started to be uh, something detrimental was happening so that you should take this uh, low temperature high slope. Uh, however, this could be, if this is instead parasitic behavior, uh, instead be an overestimate and it could be an overestimate uh, by a lot. 
Here's another example. This is data from the from the lake lakeshore tracks, uh, where we're seeing this is a single directional component um, that we're seeing a slope that's coming off that sort of uh, that's higher, and then a lower slope, uh, which is interpreted here as being uh, uh, absolute. Uh, absolute paleo, paleo intensity estimate, though it has the potential, uh, given that there are these two slopes, um, to potentially be, uh, be be an underestimate. Though and Andy made the case how in many data that could actually be getting you at uh, at an absolute estimate. Okay, so here let's go back to this um, uh, to this comp compilation here in these different bins, and I've highlighted here. Uh, these different data sets. So the ones that are being argued to be the interpreting these high slope and thus high paleo intensity values based on that interpretation of non-ideal results are these garter data, which are being shown here in blue, and then the two highest of these yellow. Barely any of those data in that in that Peasant and Hall study made it through that QPI factor. Only two where they developed data both from intrusions and from sediments did. So that would be these two highest ones right there. So if we filter those out, uh, removing those low temperature, high slope potential overestimates, uh, the data looks like this. So here again, this is going back at this cumulative distribution in these bins, where the early is blue, we then see lower uh, intensities in, uh, in green, uh, and then the late has is here in red. Now what happens if you take this and you filter out those ones that are being interpreted as overestimates is that it looks like this. It gets rid of what's effectively a heavy tail of this distribution um, such that it actually, uh, it, uh, if you do the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, um, uh, passes saying that these are, it, it's consistent with these being drawn from the same distribution. However, not changing the interpretation if you're interpreting data at binning at the, the site level, that is individual snapshots of the field, not changing the interpretation that what's within this mid bin uh, is appreciably lower in terms of the um, virtual dipole moment. Mm. However, if we apply that same filter and get rid of all the data from the mid, mid continent rift, that's where this red line is right now, we a, don't have very much data at all, and what's remaining is actually quite, quite low. So in this case, this, the, the higher intensity in this late bin and its similarity uh, to this early bin is really dependent on the data that are coming in from the lakeshore traps and from this uh, Kudakov study um, developing data from, uh, from the lakeshore traps. All right, so this motivates the mid continent rift has a sort of central uh, place in this in this record, um, and has has mot motivated work and experiments that uh, that Courtney has led and that uh, Kevin, Kevin Gasco has also uh, helped uh, helped helped run um, on uh, material largely from uh, from the Osler Osler volcanic group, um, which is shown shown here. Um, and here's an example of, 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 some, of, of some of the results. Um, here we see uh, varied, varied behavior, some of it, for those of you who are fluent with these experiments, uh, some that can be quite common, such as sagging or uh, zigzag behavior, which is likely the result of multi-domain grains. Ones where we see quite uh, dramatic double-sloped uh, behavior within a single directional component. And then results where they're not as they're not as beautiful as if we were working on uh, uh, archaeological slag, but that we're interpreting as being uh, uh, high, high high quality estimates where they are dominantly uh, dominantly single single slope. Now this potentially would be helpful to look at. Here's an example from a single flow um, where we have. Uh, uh, experimental results that we feel pretty comfortable interpreting uh, as being a single slope and where we can take an absolute uh, paleo intensity estimate uh, here being uh, 39 micro Tesla if we took this this other other sample from from the flow where we're instead seeing two sloped or actually probably arguably sagging behavior but if we interpreted the uh, the low temperature high slope you get a very significant overestimate for, for the field, around 107, if we're saying this is the truth. Um, 
those high temperature, low slope would be an underestimate, uh, but certainly not as uh, less wrong uh, than the, the low slope, lower temperature estimate, which may mean that the sort of going through the database with the, the sense of filtering out uh, these these low temperature uh, high high slope results, as was was argued in uh, Shmir FL 20, 2016, uh, is is a wise wise thing to do. Um, so here is looking at we're zoomed in in the time scale here. These are these ABBA TV uh, Dyke results where I showed showed some results. Um, here we're looking from 1140 to about 10 1080 MA. The duration of rift magnetism is right right through here. Um, here is where the bulk of the data from the mid continent rift is, is coming from these data of the, of the lake shore traps. And these are these new estimates. So these are the only the ones where we think where we have behavior that uh, we think can be interpreted as being a, a single slope. And you can see, the other thing I plotted on here, here we're actually looking at intensity. Of course, that's latitudinal dependent. What's being plotted here in the dotted line is sort of bringing the first part of the talk into the, into the picture is here we see if we're tracking, uh, this is tracking, I think, for Duluth, Minnesota, uh, if we fit through these data, uh, where we would expect if you were at a constant uh, 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 axial dipole strength that the local intensity would plot. You'd see that that perhaps uh, explains some of the variation we're seeing here, uh, though certainly not all of it, of course, because of, of, uh, of secular variation, and this is usually being collapsed in how we're plotting these as virtual, um, virtual dipole moments. But you can see that these, these data uh, corroborate over all these estimates, go, sort of going in both at the low and both at, uh, uh, both at the high end. Um, and here, uh, if we take, uh, again, going back to this cumulative distribution plot, this basically further uh, reinforces the, this curve here. This is the late time bin shown in purple uh, along, along with new data. Again, if we do the test that the comparing the, the late um, to the mid, they're very distinct from one another. Uh, if we do the late to the early, um, they're very similar. Again, using those same time bins. And you can, of course, visit this with, with other, other time bins. OK, so one of, one of the, the, what we think is a, a, a takeaway here from the current status of estimates from, uh, from the mid-continent rift, here again looking at age going from 3,500 to 500 MA, um, and with the big continent rift data being highlighted in, in colors here, is that if we take the median of these of these of these estimates, um, we're getting about 50, 56, which minus four z to amp meter squared. If you take the median as reported in uh, in Big twenty fifteen for this one to three hundred MA, uh, you're getting around around 50 plus or minus 4. So regardless of how we're sort of interpreting uh, changes through, through this record, we overall are getting a picture from a pretty well sampled part of the record a little over 1 billion years ago uh, that overall the field was similar to what it's been in more recent times. And if it is in terms, in terms of strength and at least in this window of time, there are other potential factors in time evolution, as, as, uh, as, as Andy pointed out. But nevertheless, when we're thinking about uh, the sort of power necessary for the dynamo, particularly in a, in a sort of frame of mind, the nucleation of the inner core might postdate this, this, this interval of time. Um, I think this is important to keep, keep in mind. <clears throat> now, getting at the significant increase in field strength, if we are filtering out these garter data as being, uh, as being overestimates, um, we do see that this, this um, sort of interpretation of the database, that if we look at the billion years preceding uh, the, the mid continent rift, that there are very, that the estimates are uh, generally very low. That's, of course, what we kept seeing in those cumulative uh, di distribution functions. Uh, such that this is consistent with the interpretation of an increase in, in field strength and the associated inference of additional power source to the field. Um, that that again would put that if that was being interpreted as uh, as some sort of stepwise change or, or reflection, uh, being not constrained to be prior to 1.3 GA. Now, one of the reasons this is here, I'm actually just going to move this. Okay, 
So one of the things that's, uh, that's tricky where there's a real paucity in the record that's dramatic, uh, and then I know there's, there's people who sort of seek to address, and I think we should con continue and, uh, and be really motivated to try to address, is the sort of extreme paucity of estimates uh, within, within the neo neoproterozoic. Um, it makes it difficult to assess the hypothesis that there's a stepwise uh, increase in field strength uh, given over the overall uh, paucity of data um, through that nearly 500 million year interval. There's other behavior during that time, which is uh, areas of active research as it relates to uh, potentially odd behavior uh, of the field within the later part of this plot at the, uh, at the, at the Ediacaran. Um, but that, that is, a, is a portion of the database as well as the, por the, the database as a whole uh, that uh, is in need of attention. So with that, I'd be happy to take uh, questions on any portion of this, of, of the talk. Thanks. Yes, Andy. Okay, I'm actually about the Yep. Oh, sure. Sure. Will this one do it? Yeah. So now we're using a whole kind of look more like a dog. Yeah. So I think it's, I guess the question is effectively where your, um, where the where the truth is with within that sort of reported uncertainty, I guess, right? Um, you can imagine if you were drawing samples from uh, from different places within these that you could actually fit that pretty well, sort of catch, catching the edge of that alpha ninety five uncertainty. Though perhaps you're right, and that the data are better interpreted as being a cusp like that. Um, so this is actually I, I I have one 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 slide we're sort of still. Working on this, but a, a student, a student Ian Rose, who is working with uh, Bruce Buffett, is currently doing a postdoc at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Um, uh, he he's, he sort of came up with this idea of kind of revising Richard Richard Gordon's paleomagnetic Euler pole uh, inversion approach to dealing with pole paths. Um, so here, let me not cover up cover up Ian's name. Uh, so this this would be uh, a sort of a, approach to that. We're taking in some of the data. Part of what I've been sort of frustrated with and how we're, as a community, dealing with polls uh, is that we don't incorporate age uncertainty. So for example, the running mean approach, as well as the spline approach that um, has been really popularized in um, in Tron, Tron Torres fixed compilations. I think those compilations have been hugely influential and important, and those approaches to sort of trying to bring poles together to come out with a mean path is also really important, but you want some way where you can deal with uncertainty of the age where you don't have to assign it one. In particular, in this case, I guess I feel we're having poles that we're really tightly constraining them in age, and then some of them where we have much more significant uncertainty. We know they're between, um, I guess that's actually being shown here. So what's being illustrated here is the prior probability for this um, for this inversion of the age of a given pole. So for example, this Michipakan one is what's being shown here is brown, uh, and here we have that quite tightly constrained in time. However, uh, the, the sedimentary pole that's here, uh, we know effectively that it's younger than uh, the lakeshore lake shore tract. It pushes it that way. Um, so here, this is the prior probability that's being put in for the age of each one of these poles that's being shown here. Um, in this case, I only I don't have an example that would actually sort of show your dog leg. In this case, we're uh, trying to fit it with a single Euler pole. So here it's saying let's invert the whole path for a single uh, a single Euler pole. Here are realizations of this of this approach and the sort of density of the of the Euler poles that are coming out from it. If we look at the rates associated with that, uh, the rates are are higher because we're 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 sort of fitting these these paths. To, to the data such that you're not just dealing with a latitudinal compotion, but you're, you're actually uh, satisfying uh, fitting information that's within the rotation of the block such that you get speed 
these that are around sort of centered around 26. But to get back to your question, in this case, you could either interpret that this is a dog leg coming here or coming back, or that the best answer coming out of our, our data here is that it's towards that end uh, of the alpha 95 envelope, and that the, the right answer is here instead of instead of the mean. So we've uh, in this one we're setting up this environment so that you just have one. Uh, you, we, the way we've yeah we've approached it so far is you can you can tell it to invert for two but not say where the switch point is, and so that's an additional parameter in your uh, in your approach would be where where so is the switch point. Yeah, and what you actually the trade off that you actually get if you try to invert for two Eulers instead of one uh, is that uh, the first part ends up being faster. So if I if we were to look at the histogram that's coming out of that, it actually would fit with this idea that motion was initially faster and then slowed. But the the these speeds would be up around sort of thirty and then head up head back into the into the teens. So there's some trade offs there. Yes. Um. Different weightings in terms of well, um, this is that that you're fitting all of the data. Uh -huh. So if you use a bootstrap approach and you take quite careful look at the yep. bootstrap outcome, you actually get an idea of how the different yep. weights are going to Yep, yep. Great, thanks. Yes. This was the kind of a challenging wider view of things, but can we remember about some very slow snowball? So the yeah, so the neoproterozoic gla glaciations are basically happening uh, here here in the cry cryogenian. Um, so there's the the first the first low latitude glaciation, the Sturgeon, um, initiated around seven seventeen and went to about six sixty. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a subsequent one, which we know lasted for a few million years, leading up to around 635. Um, so we are, we are sort of significantly, though, though I am quite sort of interest, interested in tracking in terms of how the sort of latitudinal, just the tectonic boundary conditions for those glaciations is, is something that is quite, is quite, quite important, and particularly how unique those boundary conditions are compared to other, other time periods. I was just, just kind of off the wall, but you know, any could you possibly go between snowball events and the Atlantic uh, in the I don't think so. So I mean, I think that's actually one thing that's important. I guess I had to cover because the the lack of the lack of having robust Paleo intensity estimates that are making it through the QPI filter is sort of a different thing than there being actually good paleomagnetic data. So, for example, we have, well, Laurentia ends up being in a very similar position right around 720 MA. There's a large igneous province, the, the Franklin large igneous province, where people develop data all across North America, have gotten reproducible constraints, there's a really high quality coal. Um, there's been some efforts on paleo intensity of those those rocks, and I uh, uh, and I think there yeah there there should be more. But you know, there's examples like South China, for example. There's some good constraints from igneous rocks, but they got beat up during paleo paleozoic orogenic events. So you might be able to pull out remnants data out of them, but not be able to do a successful paleo intensity uh, experiment. One possible link between uh, the uh, lack of paleo and uh, the snowball is that uh, if there's less uh, less um, volcanic activity, you get less CO2 being put into the uh, atmosphere. But I think that's yeah. Though so there are. It's, it's interesting. There's there's a, a paper I think that's coming out soon. Actually, argues that vol. Uh, 
sulfur aerosols coming out of the Franklin Large Igneous Province actually were an important trigger for for uh, uh, for initiation of the of the uh, seven seven twenty MA glaciation. So and maybe there's also a, a hypothesis that Laurentia actually became covered with a large igneous province, or at least the sort of modern day high Arctic did, which was sitting right in the tropics, which actually could have been a pretty important source for drawing down CO2 through through silicate mothering. But Rob. Um, thinking back to your previous slide where is it one small circle or two small circles of the data? Does that made me start to wonder about the paleo horizontal questions of you know how much systematic error do you think you might get from uncertainty in the paleo horizontal? Yeah. So we're pretty fortunate in most of these ex successions in the RIF for these poles, and I've really been focusing on extrusive volcanics, um, in that you generally have a sort of really consistent dip panels on pretty long uh, length scales, as well as um, as well as inter intercalated sediments a lot of the time, uh, as well as really effusive flows um, that you can that you can get if you collect enough data, pretty good, pretty good measurements uh, on, on flow tops. So um, I think in the case of these data, I don't think, um, at least as I sort of have filtered it out, the ones we're showing there, you could throw on a bunch more data there that are from intrusive units where they're sort of the closest extrusive is being used to put them on there. Um, that that if you include them, it sort of probably really amplifies that uncertainty. The path, as I've been showing it there, is only on extrusive units, but I think that is pretty well controlled. I would actually say a sort of slightly uh, an issue that I tried to illustrate a little bit, um, but it is an issue with some of these poles, uh, and it's not to pick on this pole. Like this is really, really high. This is really high quality, um, really high quality data. Uh, we have sort of a similar. Uh, uh, data set from some late stage rocks where we see a bit of a similar split in non fisherian uh, data. So this, that Osler example I first led with has a lot more, it's had a lot more data than this one. And that one and this one are very sort of consistent with what you'd expect of the fisherian distribution. Here I think this is probably giving you about the right answer, but it's a little tricky to have a, a, a pole in Alpha 95 that doesn't have any of the, you know, VGPs, uh, um, with, yeah, with, with it. Um, so, you know, I think, I, I think this is a pretty good, it's still a, it's still a constraint, but the, that might be a place that is throwing, uh, is throwing, is throwing uncertainty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. I had one comment. Um, it was a serious day, almost a month ago, that when I came to the Institute, I <laughs> and I just love what you've done with the place. Just fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks, Lisa. Thanks for yeah, you've done great, great, great work on it. So, thanks for okay, that. thank you. Um,